Ronan, welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction, and thank you, everybody, for being here. And I know we're running towards the end of the event, so I'll be brief in, in recapping this. Um, I, I did want to say how excited I am to be here, particularly with a group that's working so directly on what I view as one of the great challenges and potentially opportunities we all face as citizens, uh, as a nation here in the United States, and as a world. You've heard um, from a range of very accomplished speakers just now about what the stakes are, what the numbers are on the ground. Uh, I actually just got back, uh, appropriately in, in light of Caroline's discussion of numbers in the Middle East and North Africa, from five countries in that region. So if, if this is a jet-lagged rant, you'll have to forgive me. Um, and one thing that I saw in motion was the way in which these dynamics you've heard about um, are not just numbers, they're also people. I, I remember in, in Algeria, uh, last week, I, I was speaking to a 20-year-old young woman named Majda, and she told me the story of how she, like so many, left her hometown to seek opportunity in her country's capital, Algiers. She told me how excited she was uh, to get the opportunity to go to a university, how she used every opportunity that's come her way um, during her time in school, how she wrote for the school paper, studied hard, organized her fellow students around her goal and passion of increasing youth political participation as Algeria faces a seminal election that'll be made or broken by youth participation. And she told me how she sought opportunities in the real world, leveraging those skills, and found nothing. She said, there are no jobs. How can we participate if we can't support ourselves? And that's a story I've heard all around the world. Certainly in Algeria, it's the norm. We have a population there, like in so many countries in that region and across the developing world, where 70% of all the people are under the age of 30, and where 21% of the working age youth population is out of work. So the stakes are high on this, uh, as they are all around the world. I'm sure that sounds familiar to many of you in the audience. It certainly sounds familiar to me. I remember stepping into my job in the United States government and having my family react not with, wow, we're really proud that you have a job that you're passionate about, but you have a job. This is shocking. <laughs> so we've all seen this in motion in our communities around this country and around the world. And that is one of a confluence of factors that are colliding right now to create a moment where young people stand poised to threaten everything we stand for as one of the great destabilizing forces. Uh, and also, potentially, to fuel our recovery economically, politically and socially, everywhere in the world. Uh, the United States surveyed that landscape, and it's triggered a pivotal shift in our focus everywhere that we do business. We saw, as the World Bank has in launching this initiative and these conversations we're having here today, that a majority of the world's population is under the age of 30. But it's not just numbers. It's the fact that 90% of that number is, un is in the developing world. It's the fact that in so many of those developing countries, young people now have access to new technologies. Technologies that, as you just heard about in the case of mobile banking in Kenya, um, and in countless other countries where young people have led innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, technologies that fuel recovery and progress. Uh, young entrepreneurs, as I mentioned, can be the backbone of economic growth with small to medium-sized enterprises that they start. And we've seen that innovation supported by new tools and connectivity. We've seen young people as some of the greatest champions of good governance, transparency, accountability. We've seen them topple regimes in time frames that are unthinkably short. Ten, it took a decade to uh, topple a repressive regime in Poland. Um, and more recently in Tunisia, we saw it happen almost overnight with social media tools. So the game is changing and young people are functioning as a new center of gravity in reshaping events everywhere, potentially for the better. But we also see that collision of dynamics lead to the mismatch of expectation and opportunity that you just heard about today, where young people have a clear view beyond their own borders to a world of economic opportunity, of transparency and accountability, that very often is not present in their own hometowns, in their own communities. And that leads to what Secretary Clinton described in a speech she gave last week announcing a comprehensive United States focus on young people everywhere in the world, uh, a powder keg of frustrations that uh, can be capitalized on by 
extremists, terrorists, and criminal elements all around the world. So this is something uh, that we need to respond to as a moment, uh, as governments, as people, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's something we need to do, and because young people can be the greatest source of problem solving, of creative thinking, if we just tap into them. We've seen all around the world young people make headway on old problems and enmities, uh, cut through old obstacles in ways that pri prior generations, frankly, haven't. We all know that our parents' generation left us with many of our great global challenges worse off uh, than they received them. I, I also just returned from um, some time in uh, both Tel Aviv and the West Bank and spoke to young people on both sides of that very difficult, entrenched conflict, and was inspired by the optimism that I saw on both sides from young people. Obviously, that optimism isn't universal. The challenges are real. But I did see young people harnessing new tools, uh, even within the shadow of razor wire and concrete barriers that keep them apart, uh, to connect more. I met with a, a group of students uh, that we've supported and interacted with um, called YALA, which now uh, comprises 50,000 young Israelis, Palestinians, and other young people in the Middle East uh, committed to pressing for peace. So new tools are changing the game on old conflicts. Um, they're fueling progress. Uh, but if we don't capitalize on this moment to bring young people to the table, to make them feel included, and to alleviate some of those frustrations, um, we can also see them serving as a drug mule in Latin America. Uh, you know, a teenage boy manning a Taliban checkpoint in Afghanistan, where I worked for several years. Um, there are stories everywhere of young people at the heart of all of our challenges. That's exactly why uh, we've committed as a government to tapping into the positive potential I just mentioned. Uh, we have a range of programs, uh, many of them in partnership with some of the people here today that foster young entrepreneurs, give them training and mentorship, that train young civil society leaders and activists. Uh, but we're also trying to partner with young people as honest partners. And part of that is here in Washington, where we're having high-level conversations with governments, keeping these issues on the table, and with young people, where our Secretary of State, our President, who when he wanted to strengthen our relations with co countries across the African continent, uh, didn't just sit down with leaders. He brought a delegation of 100 young African leaders from civil society and business uh, to the United States to consult with them, um, and f across the board with, with all of our officials here. But more importantly, it has to happen at a grassroots level. And that's why one of the initiatives that Secretary Clinton announced last week is that we are building wherever the United States flag flies, at consulates and embassies around the world, councils of local young people that we bring in and consult as honest partners, uh, that we harness for ideas on how we should change our policies, what we're doing well, but also what we can do better, and that we tap for good ideas and creative thinking and try to link up with, if not our own resources, then certainly outside resources to start their own projects. Uh, I've, I've met with young people all around the world that are now engaged in those councils of youth that we've convened, um, including in Nepal, where I met a young man who uh, faced a lack of educational opportunity in his hometown and then went out and started what is now a sustainable business um, providing educational and mentorship tools um, to people in his community. So we can see stories where young people are affecting change in their communities. And in aggregate, I really believe that that can affect change all around the world. Now, we're seeing that in cases where the human story is changing too. And one of the things that made me happiest is seeing that Majda, who I mentioned before in Algeria, uh, is now a member of a council of local youth advisors that we talk to and work with, and has now started her own business, um, which is proving to be profitable thus far, and we'll be watching closely. But that's the kind of story we want to see all over the world. If we want to see that replicated, it'll require a call not just to young people themselves, but also to governments and to businesses. We need to see governments create free and open investment environments so that foreign businesses can come to the table and have incentives to create an investment environment where young people can have jobs within existing private sector institutions. We need to see an investment environment for young entrepreneurs who can, equally importantly, create brand new job opportunities in their communities. 
We need to see businesses come to the table. And in this, I commend the Nike Foundation and, and Manpower, um, both of whom are, are close partners. Uh, we're working with, with Manpower on uh, one initiative that Secretary Clinton discussed and that we're all uh, excited about uh, in, in that speech last week which is a partnership on a global level of businesses committed to sharing best practices on youth hiring and fostering uh, youth leadership. That involves making sure that HR departments have designated point people on youth hiring, that companies are engaged not just on their corporate social responsibility side, but also in their core business practices in making sure that young people are linked up to the hiring opportunities that they're offering. Um, and it also means that on that corporate social responsibility side, as the critical work that the Nike Foundation is doing illustrates, uh, they need to invest maximally in youth investment, uh, youth mentoring, and youth training. So I look forward to partnering with businesses around the world who I think really are a linchpin of this effort for all of us and who increasingly are coming to understand that this is not just a charity act or something that is right, but something that in harnessing the tremendous potential of young workers um, is also good for the bottom line. Finally, as I mentioned, it also does fall to you and me and young people all around the world to participate to stand up and build solutions in your communities, like the stories of some of the young people that I mentioned from around the world. Um, many of you in this room are already doing that. Uh, the people on this panel are working with young people who are doing that actively. But we need to see more of it if we want to see an economic recovery and if we want to see free and open governments around the world, particularly in this moment of uncertainty and change in so many countries where young people have been courageous enough to lead revolutions, to stand up for their rights and their futures in the moment of protest. We need to see that followed through on with commitment to sustainable institutions, with lasting participation. I'm reminded of a, a young Tunisian blogger named Walada, who said in a blog leading up to their essential elections, uh, resignation and negativity do not make a country, nor do they make a world. Thank you all.